I want to welcome everyone to another one of our brilliant lunchtime seminar series of new voices in global security. Um, today, uh, we have, um, you know, well, I just want to actually um, do, uh, you know, a, a shout out to the great lineup of speakers that we've had so far that have brought a, a raise awareness of the multitude of security issues and brought to the fore really novel and important perspectives as how we um, look at global security today. And of course, today is no exception. We're so pleased to welcome Ms. Alvina Hoffman um, to present uh, her work uh, for us today. So Ms. Um, Alvina Hoffman is a PhD candidate in international relations at King's College London. She's also a co-convener of the LIST DTP funded um, international political sociology PhD seminar series and a research assistant for the ESRC or ERC funded uh, project security flow. So um, Alvina, you keep yourself very busy. Um, Within all of this um, busyness of her life, she still has managed to recently co-author a publication in international political sociology uh, called Collective Discussion Towards Critical Approaches to Intelligence as a Social Phenomenon. So definitely check that out if you have not already. So today Alvina will be presenting some of her doctoral work for us. Her title of her talk is Speaking Like an Expert, UN Special rapporteurs as spokespersons of the universal. So the, the, present, or the presentation and, and paper uh, really grapples with the question of how does someone become mandated to speak as an expert on behalf of the universal? And her paper examines the position of the UN Special Rapporteur described as the eyes and ears of the international human rights architecture. Alvina analyzes the relationship between this independent expert, the security general, and states in order to locate special rapporteurs in a broader field of struggle to speak independently. Ms. Hoffman explores the UN Special Rapporteurs as a new type of international civil servant. Unlike diplomats or official representatives of international organizations and permanent positions who are entrusted with similar privilege, privileges and immunities in their temporary positions. This paper draws upon 15 in-depth biographical interviews with current and former special rapporteurs and a, a bibliography or a bibliography analysis of over 150 uh, current and former mandate holders. So Ms. Ms. Hoffman's discussant today uh, will be Dr. Monique Burley. Monique is a scholar in international relations whose research and teaching interests include international political sociology, global humanitarianism, security, quantification ex expertise, and international non-government organizations. Using a range of qualitative methods from um, uh, including historical ethno ethnography, her work explores power dynamics that structure uh, and arise in connection to global practices of protection, saving lives and care. Her work has appeared in international political sociology, global governance and international peacekeeping. She is also um, presently the co-editor of political anthropological research on international social science, a new interdisciplinary journal that cuts across disciplines, academic cultures and writing styles. Her current project, Fighting for Humanity, is funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation. And uh, in this, Monique entangles um, competing visions of humanitarianism as a moral and political project within International Red Cross and the Red Crescent Movement. So again, um, we are have an amazing lineup of speakers with um, some pretty fabulous expertise. Uh, really happy to, to be a part of these discussions. As usual, I just ask everyone to mute themselves Themselves. Um, Alvina has agreed to talk for 20 minutes and then Monique will be offering some discussant points before we open it up to broader question and answer. Uh, during the question and answer, you're um, more than welcome to raise your virtual Zoom hand and ask a question um, live or please put it in the chat box, either uh, works. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over to you, Alvina. Great, thank you so much for this very nice and generous introduction, Amanda. And um, I just wanna thank everyone for coming to see me present this chapter for the first time. And of course, of course, a huge thanks to Monique, um, who couldn't be a more brilliant discussant um, to read this 
raw material for the first time. So I'm really, really pleased and happy to have this opportunity. So um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so I hope you can bear with me just talking to this uh, virtual audience. Um, what I thought of doing is um, I, I'll first talk a little bit about my broader PhD project. So you kind of know where this chapter sits um, in the thesis because it's kind of right in the middle. So it would be good to know where it sits you know, within, within the narrative before and afterwards. Um, and then we'll dig into the actual chapter, um, which Monique read, um, and we can discuss that. So um, Amanda already gave you a little bit um, of an insight into what I'm doing. And basically what my PhD project is about, um, it's about different kinds of spokespersons um, who proclaim something like an aspirational human rights universalism. And then I explore this through um, unexpected connections that emerge between different sides of claims making. Um, so I'm really kind of interested in the questions of what does it mean when someone claims to speak on behalf of someone else? And so here, basically in the context of human rights claims for, for example, a social group or a global cause such as human rights. And how does someone even get into a position um, from which they can speak in the name of someone and proclaim such a universalism? So kind of theoretically, I'm really interested in all these mechanisms of authorization um, to impose authorized speech. And sometimes the speech is not so authorized as I'll show in different chapters of the thesis. Um, exactly. So I look at the various ways, kind of legal, political, and social mechanisms um, through which speech in the name of someone takes place. And um, examples are, for example, through very close proximity um, to someone's people or minority group, where over time, um, you know, very close relationships are established, and then a spokes someone becomes kind of, as they claim, a natural spokesperson of their people. Um, then there are other routes of authorization, for example, when an organization like the UN gives a mandate to someone, you are now mandated to speak on behalf of specific human rights violations or causes. Um, and here this speech, and we'll, we'll get into this in a couple of minutes, is really conceived of um, as amplifying voices, as really serving as a mere intermediary. Um, that allows these groups to access new sites, new stages. So this is their own kind of self-understanding of the speech on behalf. Um, and sometimes the speech can be simply usurped and imposed um, on everyone without any prior mechanisms of authorization. And in my PhD, I use the example of the annexation of Crimea and um, Crimea's prime minister, uh, current prime minister. So this is, was a person who immediately made sure to quickly present themselves as a natural representative of real Crimeans. So, from you know, one day to another, they have tried to be a politician, weren't really elected, so they came and just usurped speech and imposed themselves as the prime minister. So this is just to give you a kind of idea of the different types of spokespersons that I'm dealing with in a thesis. And um, my thesis more broadly investigates these theoretical questions um, through the example of UN Special Rapporteurs, which we'll uh, uncover today, the Sami people and Crimean Tatars. And I chose these sites simply because of the real kind of empirical connections that I uncovered while doing research, starting with Crimea. So this is what I meant with kind of unexpected connections emerging and proclaiming, proclaiming human rights universalisms. Um, so as I said, this chapter is right in the middle, it's chapter three. So some stuff happened before, some stuff will happen afterwards. And what I did before um, in the chapter was basically look at this UN Special Rapporteur as a very kind of awkward actor that sits somewhere within, but not really in the UN. So where is the social position? How can we locate um, this independent expert? Um, basically, it's just someone who has a lot of human rights credentials, is appointed by the UN Human Rights Council, either for three or six years. And then what they do is they conduct field work or just work more generally on a specific human right. Um, they write thematic reports, they conduct field visits, um, usually two a year, they issue communications on behalf of victims. Um, so this is how their tasks are kind of officially defined. Um, basically what they are is unpaid volunteers and they continue working in their full-time jobs and the vast majority of them are university teachers and we all know how stressful that is. And I'll combine that with work on, you know, um, communications on torture, for example, just everything that happens globally on torture, you're responsible for that and you're not unpaid. So this is their kind of material um, background of their position. Um, what's quite interesting is the UN describes them as their eyes and ears. So, so they are in the field, they, see, they are oftentimes the first kind of UN representatives, according to the UN, who see 
uh, new emerging human rights um, issues or violations, for example. Um, and so what they can do is they can not only expose these violations, but also propose innovations in the field. And my chapter, I'll explain that in a couple of minutes, uh, will show how they do that and how they are able to do that. Um, so chapter two, the previous chapter basically looked at the position in the broader U UN human rights architecture. And I was really quite interested in a notion of independence, this independent act actor. So not as a personal trait or proclamation of impartiality, of objectivity, but really as a social position. So much more structural in relation to states or state representatives, um, UN bodies, but also NGOs or the, the kind of um, human rights violations they're dealing with. So how could, can we find this awkward, not institutionally not quite well-defined um, social position of independence in the UN? And quite interesting is they always distance themselves from the UN. This is quite important while using their resources and the authority that comes with wearing the UN badge when they conduct the visits. Um, and what I did in that chapter is um, I looked at um, the various forms of capital, so social, um, for, uh, social especially, cultural, um, but also symbolic capital and the transformations over time since this position was created in nine, around 1978. It has a bit of a more complex um, history to this, but um, the very first one was considered to be created then. And just to summarize this on the basis of 150 kind of biographical um, mappings that I did, um, we had a profile of a state lawyer right in the beginning. Um, so people who are quite high up either in the Supreme Courts um, or become, being a diplomat, some of them were state ministers. And it's slowly, the profile slowly broadened. So it didn't get replaced, but it broadened into human rights academics as human rights law became a real kind of discipline um, to a kind of more activist profile of people who headed their own NGOs and they didn't quite have the same allegiance to their states to just general professionals who are experts in a specific right like housing or the right to water that, don't, that doesn't necessarily require just pure legal knowledge. Although the vast majority are lawyers, they need to play the language, uh, they need to play the game of international law, and we'll see that in a couple of minutes. And um, so, yeah, it's a quite, quite interesting to examine this um, against the backdrop of a broader proliferation of this position. There were only a handful of special rapporteurs, so on the right, torture, extrajudicial killings, um, disappearances, and now there are over 50. So in something like the human right to solidarity, international solidarity. So some of them are really quite vaguely defined and some of them are more critical than others about this proliferation. So this, this is just to give you a background on um, what happened before. And now I'll turn to my chapter. So in, the, in this chapter that I'm presenting and that Monique read, um, what I'm trying to do is deepen this um, understanding of special rapporteurs from a more sociological and political theoretical perspective. So what kind of spokesperson is the special rapporteur? And um, what kind of strategies and practices do special rapporteurs develop to increase their own effectiveness or to use a Bourdieuian term, symbolic power? Um, what the UN does, um, they grant them different forms of authority, legal authority, expert authority, moral authority. This is how they kind of prescribe them in their different documents. And um, in the chapter, instead of reifying these different forms of authority, I try to explore what kind of practices or strategies they can develop from being given these kind of little pockets um, from where to conduct their work. Um, and they, they do that and that allows them to insert themselves into really quite uh, interesting games, uh, which wasn't necessarily conceived of in the beginning. For example, at um, different UN committees, which are kind of hidden underneath the layer of the Security Council, like the Counterterrorism Committee is a really good example that's really effective. And here you really get your policy done. And so being able to, you know, meet people and become part of that can really mean, you know, you can bring the language of human rights back into these closed um, policymaking spaces but also during the state visits. So A is to access specific states, go to China, go to, I don't know, Brazil and so on, but also when you're in states to really um, have your own uh, terms of reference and get access to wherever you wanna go, whether that's a rebel held area or a prison or, you know, so, so just be able to kind of stretch this, this, the scope of their mandate. Um, and then in the kind of advocacy work with NGOs, 
And um, something that's also very effective is, is especially legal proceedings um, in, for example, national or regional courts. So um, they file, for example, amicus briefs and really use their expert authority and really construct their uniqueness of having access to specific material to um, leverage certain court decisions. Um, so the chapter begins um, with a few interview interviews and, and material from those interviews where special rapporteurs kind of go between this discourse of endless opportunities and possibilities that's afforded to them because of their independence. They, they're not really mandated by anyone and it's literally just them to a real pessimism and the kind of uselessness of the work. You can't do anything. It feels more like a fig leaf. It's ridiculous. We have a backlog of 500 cases every day. So I, I really found this kind of dialectic back and forth between this hopefulness and, and pessimism quite interesting to uncover, okay, so how do you actually get something done and, and so on. So, um, and this happens basically against the backdrop of um, the lack of material support. Not only are they not paid, but also they just have one human rights officer in, um, in their offices in Geneva, which they hardly ever spend any time in. And um, so how do you then multiply your own body and create a team and where do you get the resources from beyond just, you know, doing all this important human rights work. Um, and so some of them say this was the best job they ever had and the, the, the mandate was the honor of a lifetime. Um, and so, yeah, what, what can they actually do and um, how can they formulate a new human rights universalism? And for me, what is quite interesting is it's, it's all about, from the interviews and from what I got about multiplying the voices of who can actually proclaim and formulate this human rights uh, universalism. So it's not just imposing their own understandings of torture, but it's really building alliances across um, the field and across different institutional spaces. Um, with people that wouldn't normally talk to each other. Um, so the chapter has kind of um, two separate parts. Uh, in the first part, I look at legal authority. Um, so the kind of um, immunities and privileges that they are granted, um, kind of like diplomats almost, or international civil servants, even though they're not officially representing the UN. And um, yeah, so what, what, what allows them to speak completely independently without being sued by anyone else. And there were two very interesting um, ICJ, International Court of Justice, advisory opinions um, issued on this. And then the second part really looks at the practices and strategies. So which games are they playing and do they consider worth playing? And which practices contribute to, and then I, I use this really nice phrase by Bourdieu, um, creating um, universal access to the conditions of access to the universal. So not just kind of proclaiming a universalism that's already given, but how do we get you kind of democratize the space from which to proclaim a universalism. So reverse this logic um, and to what extent they're actually able to do that um, or not. So I'll briefly tell you about the two advisory opinions, which are, which are quite interesting um, because they really get to the core of some very central IR questions. For example, is there higher authority above states? You know, we learned that all in our first year um, and so on. What is the relationship between citizens and their states? But also, what is the relationship between the UN General Secretary, international courts, states, when they all disagree on a certain thing? And um, this is where special rapporteurs, as this awkward actor, really, really got to the core of um, international relations problems. Um, let me drink some water. So the first case, um, the, both cases were only about five years apart from each other in the 90s, which is quite interesting, when we started to see a proliferation of this position. Um, was Special Rapporteur Matsilo, and he uh, was mandated to write a report on human rights and youth, and he was a Romanian national, and he decided to do that from his home in Romania, and then when he was supposed to show up and present his report, he was nowhere to be seen, and um, so they were wondering, where was he? The Romanian authorities said he was really sick, and after a couple of years, finally, they managed to hear from him, and he said, well, he didn't get he didn't get a, a travel permit, he couldn't leave Romania, so the authorities weren't quite happy with him. And so um, here really what was at stake is, is whether or not a country can, can kind of, or sorry, whether a special rapporteur can claim immunities and privileges against their own country. And can the ICJ, can the UN actually intervene here? 
And um, what was also interesting about this case is that for the first time, they needed to really get a systematic um, understanding of what special rapporteurs have actually been doing in the UN, because you kind of appoint them, they do what they want and goodbye in a sense. But here you had um, a general secretary, the legal uh, council of the UN, and also a lot of states um, compile a big dossier and opinions. And this was all submitted to the court uh, to kind of get a sense of you know what is the special rapporteur are they becoming you know something broader than just themselves and um yeah in the end the court basically ruled that experts on mission uh, this is the kind of legal term um have these immunities even against their own state because mission doesn't mean you have to travel abroad but it means a specific task um so they clarified you know their legal position they clarified that these immunities um basically do apply even against your own state the second case, a couple of years later, um, was pushed us even a little bit higher, or it, uh, like in a different direction. It wasn't just a repetition of the previous case. It was really about the Secretary General and their relationship, or his, because it's only men, relationship with, with states and courts. And can the Secretary General actually decide retrospectively whether a special rapporteur has spoken in their capacity, in their official capacity, rather than the private capacity? So what happened is Special Rapporteur Kumar Raswami, a Malaysian um, citizen, he was appointed as a Special Rapporteur on the independence of the judiciary. And um, he issued very critical um, opinions about his own home state, Malaysia, and the court system there in a kind of UK-based publication. The courts didn't like it at all, and four lawsuits were filed against him for defamatory speech. And so the Secretary General intervened and said, this was issued on the basis of his official position, not as a private person. You cannot sue him. They tried anyways, and then the ICJ again intervened and um, again confirmed this. And what was quite interesting in this case, they also confirmed that the Secretary General is the highest authority over the UN and over anyone who's employed under the UN. Um, but at the same time, it left open for national courts to um, basically say, we disagree. So. Um, Again, quite quite interesting um, questions that were not really quite settled um, um, in terms of this. So um, this describes their legal authority and gives them space or the opportunity to do lawmaking exercises. But there's more to that, of course. And um, the second part looks at um, basically the practices and strategies. And so what I was trying to do is to um, kind of map them and theorize them on the basis of the kind of spokespersons that they are. And I have um, practices that contribute to a kind of embodiment of voices and viewpoints when they meet with experts, with local kind of NGOs and so on, when they negotiate access to sites and try to stretch the scope of their mandate, and when they construct and circulate legal knowledge. Um, and so I'll just very briefly wrap up by mentioning a few examples of these practices. Um, for example, embodiment. Um, this refers back to something I, I um, kind of opened up when I problematized the spokesperson in the first chapter, where basically in a nutshell, to summarize 10,000 words, a uh, spokesperson comes into being when, when they kind of try to embody a social group in this kind of spiral relationship. And then at some point when they speak, they claim to speak for all and kind of their speech is the, speak of, the speech of all of these individuals. And for special rapporteurs, this imagery doesn't quite apply, and it's more imagery of alliances and connections um, through the kind of experts they assemble um, when, or when they try to build teams and multiply their body and send them out to represent themselves, when they get together with um, states and have quite surprising meetings, as many of them told me, I would be very surprised to know who they're able to meet. Um, so there's a more of an imagery of alliances, but they still are able to kind of articulate many different views at the same time. Um, and then access, as I said previously, it's, it's specifically about um, getting into institutional spaces, legal spaces, but also within states, really far away places. And um, basically it's, it's a way to stretch the mandate. What can I do? How far can I go? And, and always negotiating um, yeah, what, what they can do basically on the basis of this. And um, finally, and something that's really exciting, I think, is the, the knowledge part where they really understand themselves as globalizing, universalizing and making visible specific human rights. So really becoming this kind of spokesperson of a universalism through these uh, different forms of um, practices I just mentioned. And um, for them, knowledge is really a form of empowerment of local actors, of reform-minded civil servants and states. 
but also a form of playing the game of international law through the resources of the UN. So really these legal formulations, words, clarifications, and this back and forth, it's a real kind of legal diplomacy, which they are not at all taught by the UN and they kind of need to develop on the job. Um, they file amicus briefs at various courts and so on. And um, finally, what's also quite exciting, sometimes their own reports, their kind of country reports are also cited in um, court proceedings. For example, the European Court of Human Rights had a case in Hungary and they relied on the report by the working group on disappearances um, to issue their statement basically. So there's a quite an interesting legal resource that is built up here and others review draft le legislations um, is what they do. So yeah, this is basically um, it. Um, you know, this chapter is quite long and I have much more detailed examples, but I really look forward to what Monique has to say and what everyone else has to say. Thanks so much. I think you're muted, Monique. There we go. There. So I just jump in directly then, Amanda? Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, Thank you, Alvina, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you for the, the fascinating paper. I've always found, um, I'm gonna call them UNSPs to be short, <laughs> UNSPs to be a very kind of ominous figure and yet you know, mysterious. And so you, you do an excellent job of kind of, well, showing to us and explaining this ambiguity. Um, so in terms of comments, I won't summarize as you've, um, You've done a good job yourself of going over the main points um, of the paper, but I just, you know, wanted to point out the fact that at least in my reading of this chapter, there are kind of multiple stories that that are coming through. So on the one hand, we kind of, as you said, see this this hardship of being a UNSP and and their almost vulnerability in the system, which I found to be kind of paradoxical because on the one hand, we could see them as a type of international elite who has um, you know, a privileged position in a sense to be exactly in this role of the spokesperson, and yet they're under-resourced, they question the effectiveness of their, of their own work, and in that sense, their work comes across as kind of less glamorous than, um, than we might imagine, at least seeing these actors circulate and, and do their work on the international arena. Um, your paper also speaks to different forms of authority mobilized by UNSPs. Um, whether that be legal rational authority or more the, the expert and, and moral. Uh, it speaks to how they participate in the making of international human rights, which is where I think that you make um, quite a significant or that this thesis will make quite a significant contribution to the literature is really first off debunking this idea that it's only international courts um, that have authority to interpret international law, which I don't know if that's something that you develop more in terms of how you position yourself with the state of the art. Um, but I think that you could put more emphasis on your kind of originality and your contribution um, on that point. So really their, their role um, in the making or the interpretation, let's say of international human rights, which you argue is not just as solo actors. Um, although in this paper, we kind of get more of that perspective. We see more their even if it is drawing connections between different actors, we see them as the sort of creative entrepreneurs who are orchestrating all of that. Um, uh, it also speaks to all of the controversies, right, around whether or not UNSBs speak independently or not, um, which I think is something I'll get to a bit later, but could be more conceptually entangled in terms of how ambiguity actually works as a, kind of resource or as a, um, as a condition that, that almost enhances um, their power to act. And there may be the work of like Jacqueline Best on bureaucratic ambiguity um, as a resource for IOs. I mean, she looks at IOs, but here you could maybe apply that to this specific category of international actor. Um, it talks about the social life of reports written by UNSPs, how they might act as types of evidence, how they might inform then or be used to argue for different types of international legislation, as well as these kind of struggles between international and national forms of authority. Um, in the way that you kind of position yourself with the literature, I read this chapter notably as a critique of the IR norms literature on human rights that is, I mean, that, that really 
focus more on the, or they assume the universality of human rights without assessing the role that different actors might play, for example, um, in interpreting those rights, as well as in a way critiquing this, this clear binary between the, the national and the international. So by through these actors and the struggles that they're involved in, um, you give a kind of more complex nuanced view. So maybe some um, questions and comments um, that I have regarding the, the content, the structure, and also picking up a bit on some of the points that you presented more in your presentation when situating the overall thesis um, that did already address some of the questions that I had, but I'd like to hear you speak on one or two points a bit further in detail. Um, so the first is maybe a, a more conceptual point about how you conceive of authority. And so in the paper, you, you do, you know, you use these different terminologies, you unpack notably legal authority on the one hand, and then expert and moral authority on the other, which I, I've found that you give a little bit less attention to how these interconnect or are differentiated from one another, but I'll uh, assume that perhaps there's, a, there's someplace else in the thesis where, um, where you do that. But it's what is unclear to me is whether you conceive of a third authority as an attribute that is given to an individual, in this case by an institution being the United Nations, and it's through that allocation of a nomination or title um, that these individuals take on, you know, the role of the of the expert on mission or of the UNSP, um, and so therefore authority is attributive, um, or whether it's it's more relational because given the kinds of uh, social theory that you're working with, uh, there is an assumption that of course that you know there are power relations involved in in the recognition of that authority and so forth. So there's an interactive dynamic. Um, but I find that there's a bit like a tension in the kind of language that you use to speak about authority. So if you could maybe uh, provide some clarifications um, on, on that point. Also uh, on a more conceptual front. So, I mean, and this is something that of course I, I understand like very on a very personal level and I struggled with, my, I struggled myself with, um, is when applying certain concepts from social theory and notably from, from the work of Bourdieu to a kind of international setting to an IR, to set to IR sets of questions. And I guess where I, th I think that for the most part, the, the conceptual framing of the chapter works really well and, and, um, and is coherent and, and makes sense. The only <clears throat> place where I had a little bit of pause was maybe actually with this language of social position. And I wonder if, I mean, because for me, you're not talking about a social position. It's this adjective social that is, that I, that I find um, somewhat disconnected, right? So, I mean, Bourdieu, when he talks about social position, I mean, first off, he's trying to look in a framework of a society, um, which granted is, you know, somewhat bound uh, to a certain extent. Um, and in which we are trying to understand hierarchies between, let's say the dominant and the dominated. And then, of course, analyzing different types of, of, of capitals and uh, subjective position makings that then inform the configuration of that space, right? One of the difficulties is that when we're working with a really complex institutional setting, which we could describe here like the human rights, I don't know, the international uh, space of human rights institutions and actors, <clears throat> The, the terminology of, of social position seems somewhat disconnected from what it is that you're that you're actually describing and that you're that you're actually showing us. So I, I wonder um, if that has been something or maybe a challenge for you in kind of trying to translate in a sense um, Bourdieu's theory to this to this case. Um, and perhaps then if a slight, I mean, because it, it's still important to talk about position, right? And the positioning of these actors. Um, but I think that maybe it would be more fruitful given the kind of, um, at least that come across in this chapter, the kind of dynamics that you're explaining, it might be to talk about um, 
kind of it's hard also because it's not exactly institutional positioning right? and that's what's also fascinating about about these actors but we could maybe just talk about positions of power um for example might be because it's, that's what you're kind of interested in how these actors are exerting different types of power through forms of authority that they wield that are both given to them but also expanded upon um so maybe yeah they're the um the literature on like transnational power elites and how they uh, conceptualize that might be more fruitful. So, or or you could talk also maybe about like discretionary power and their position of of discretionary power within this larger larger framework. Um, yes. Um, The, I had also, I mean, again, I, I think that there, what I found really interesting in this paper, again, is this, um, this tension and this ambiguity between, on the one hand, being directly mandated by the United Nations, the fact that they, they carry UN in their title. Um, there's at some point in the paper where you talk about, I think it's, um, one of the, the UNSP, UNSPs talks about the UN badge as a material object that they use to access, hard to access sites, be those prisons or detention centers. So in a way, of course, you know, the symbolic kind of authority of the United Nations as, a, as an institution is absolutely key um, to their work. And yet they are always kind of trying to separate themselves. So I, I don't know, I just wonder if you could speak more to the way that you, you see the interconnectivity, right, between this, or how you could conceptualize further this, this dual positioning, this multi-positioning of institutional proximity and institutional separation, um, which seems really contradictory, but it, at the same time, it seems to be at the, the core of, of, how their, um, of how their work operates and is really counterintuitive to a lot of the ways that we think about delegation, for example. I mean, so here, if you wanted to do a side paper on international organizations and um, delegation, which always has this very linear, an organization or a state delegate to an international organization, and then an international dele uh, international organization delegates directly to, uh, let's say, international civil servants. But you give us like a very um, a less direct, linear, and kind of this in-between um, Position. So I, I think that that is, uh, again, a, a sort of contribution of this paper or an area where um, the paper is quite rich. Perhaps um, just one last comment on structure. So I actually, I mean, you've explained a little bit the overall structure of the thesis, but I think that this chapter is in fact two chapters. Uh, the first part is to me at, is asking very different questions which speak to these higher order IR questions about you know, um, the difference between uh, national versus international authority. In a sense, what's really interesting too about your case is that you show that it is, it's kind of through defining the role of the UNSPs that there's also a constitution of the international. So there's this interconnect, like a broader, a broader set of, of uh, dynamics that are at play. And I at least had the feeling in reading the paper and reading the chapter that because it, there's a lot of material to go through and you have really rich, um, you've, you've done some rich field work, some rich document analysis, that it comes across as kind of rushed. And so you don't get to go deep into those questions. And it's almost as though there are sometimes um, we are assumed to understand what the higher order questions are and you go through them really quickly. So again, I don't wanna disrupt like the overall um, structure of the thesis, but I wondered it because you, you do mention that in the previous chapter, you talk about independence. So in a way, these two legal cases um, that you present, which are, are really fascinating cases, they speak exactly to how this is dealt with. And, and the kind of making of a, of a UNSP, whereas the second part of the paper really speaks to how the UNSPs participate in the making of, uh, you know, international human rights and its and its meanings. And so 
I, I don't know. I, my kind of feeling was that um, these two things, of course they're interconnected, but in a way it's the first set of legal rational authority questions that are kind of on a different level than these more everyday uh, professional practices of these agents, which through their everyday practices then kind of constitute what it means to do human rights or this kind of human rights work, which is, which is really rich. And I think that would allow you to also go like deeper into the vignettes that you present, even the introduction. I felt that in a way we get like thrown in this um, tunnel and, and there's like a lot going on in there and we're trying to absorb it all at the same time. And I, I personally actually would almost resituate some of these initial vignettes um, that, you, that you open up with within the text. And I would start with an intro that is a bit um, maybe more you know, straightforward and that talks about the, the international making and so forth. Um, and I don't know, if there's time, I would love to hear a little bit more on um, access to the field that you are studying. So uh, why, why these UNSPs? What are some access constraints that you, um, that you encountered? I imagine that it's quite difficult to get in touch with these people. Um, how satisfied are you with the, with the people that you were able to get in touch with, with the interviews? Um, and also just on anonymity, I'm curious with the final manuscript, are you gonna be able to cite these individuals on the one hand it seems like they are like or some of them are open to being public critical like figures that can be critiqued um but what are some of the stakes of of doing that and i'll stop there thank you for a great paper albina well thank you for a great discussion too this is fab i'm learning so much just through this conversation so alvina now the the agency is with you in that we've um sarah pret also has a question too so it's up to you if you want to respond right now to monique's uh or do you want to collect um you know um see what sarah's question is and and then respond to all of them at that point which Sure. Choice is Just yours. thank you, Monique. This is really amazing. I mean, I, I have so many answers and questions within those answers, but maybe we can take Sarah and then I can address them all together and kind of hopefully link them transversally in a, in a way. Perfect. That sounds good. Great. Sarah, you're up. Hello, everyone, and thank you for this uh, really interesting presentation, Avina. I, I learned a lot, uh, I have to admit, as well. Um, actually, my question is quite related to uh, what uh, Monique just uh, raised uh, at her last comment uh, regarding your fieldwork. I was actually a bit curious about your interactions with those experts uh, during the interviews you, you conducted. Um, how you had to to present yourself and and how you 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 felt they they were positioning themselves with you uh, especially in their position of being high skills uh, experts uh, did they try to emphasize some of their dispositions uh, in a Bodhisattvan uh, sense uh, in front of you uh, to to prove maybe their legitimacy to to speak as an expert. Um, and also, did you feel any asymmetric um, uh, power relations uh, in those interactions during uh, the interview? So I would like to, to listen to you more uh, about this aspect of your field work. Thank you. Great, thank you. Maybe I should start with the fieldwork question then, um, because we've had two of them. Um, so sadly, my last round of fieldwork was canceled. So. You know, we, we all have to deal with that. So really most of them were conducted already over the course of the year over Skype, that old technology no one seems to be using anymore. Um, and to be honest, most of them are academics and it just felt like because I'm a PhD researcher and they're academics, there was this solidarity and they were really curious just to see that someone is asking these questions and tries to make sense of them. So I never really felt like, you know, I interviewed some retired diplomat, for example, where the dynamics are different. But again, not really power relations. I think people were just curious, you know, like it never really came through in the way, um, I don't know, what that you felt kind of 
less inclined to ask questions and so on. But I can I can talk about that in, in, at some point with you in more detail. And um, in terms of access, um, be persistent. Email them. Keep emailing them. Um, you know, once you get one person, they're able to kind of forward you on, and then you select a bunch of names. Like it was really, you know, just be persistent. And the way I try to do this is on the basis of my um, empirical cases. So I interviewed the special rapporteurs and working groups that went to Ukraine. It never managed to go to Crimea, but these were the main actors who basically went there, the main actors who went to um, Norway to, to um, do research um, basically on the Sami, which is my other um, kind of size. So these were my kind of core special rapporteurs. And then just basically those who were kind of related to the ones that I interviewed, either through joint communications um, or just general communications that they issued as a kind of quick thing that you do and quickly you know, condemn you know, the lack of freedom of speech in Crimea or something like that. Um, so this is then another way and then just special rapporteurs who just kept coming up in the news and then it's really just a matter of whether or not they respond to me um, and then and then you know I had a second of second and third round of interviewing when I still had um, open questions and then I managed to find um, a retired one um, who's you know in his 80s and was very happy to talk to me as well um, so it was really kind of yeah first round is always quite awkward of interviews you're really figuring out what it is you're doing you get a sense of this mysterious actor as Monique was saying and then you kind of establish more and more questions um, and kind of link them thematically but also practically to your question um, or they mentioned someone like this is the best special rapporteur that was ever appointed great i'm going to interview that one and luckily i managed to so it, it yeah it, you just have to start somewhere and then i think there's a logic of research that emerges through the interviews through the names they mention and through the material that they put out um, about themselves um great let me go through monique's questions quickly unless anyone else um has some questions um so we had a lot about um, authority, and yeah, I, I agree. It's basically, it's it's the it's the word or the term used by the UN, and it's a term used by this literature, you know, Ole Jakob Sending and so on. They they quite like working on international authority, but it's never really been a word they use themselves um, in a sense. You know, they I, I don't I don't remember them saying, "Oh, I'm an authority on human rights." It's more like I'm an expert, or I have a lot of field experience, or I, I know this from the field, so I knew how to get into the, it was always more a much more practical sense and a practical logic than relying on them being a moral voice. Although with the retired person, there was much more about morality and, and this kind of um, international civil service and, and what it means. And, and so that language I feel like was more used in the seventies maybe when, when human rights was really quite coupled to this real moral language. But now it's much more judicialized, I feel. So I guess that's why I didn't quite develop it in this chapter because I was struggling with it myself because I felt like the authority we're dealing with um, on this practical level is not really the one um, discussed in the IR literature. And, and basically in, in, the, in the interviews, it's more like, or, or in the documents, they are given this. And so what they do is they disclaim it. Oh, I, I have this authority because the document tells me I can then do whatever I wanna do, whatever I wanna say, but um, yeah, I will, I will have to think about that. And I think, yeah, the relational aspect is really quite important because it's always a form of negotiation. Um, I don't know if you use that term, um, Monique, but um, it's really about how you negotiate where you stand in the space and in relation to the secretary general, um, states and so on. So um, yeah, I'll try, it. yeah, I need to, I guess, highlight that more. And I quite like the discussion about social position because in the, in the previous chapter, what I'm trying to do, and I should spend much more time doing that is um, disrupt um, kind of bureaucratic understandings. You know, where, where is the special rapporteur or oh, in the human rights council? What is the function of the human rights council? And you, you just miss like everything basically because nothing for them takes place in the human rights council. They go and present their report. It's a kind of theatrics, you know, oh, so much torture, oh, we're upset now, next, next fresh rapporteur. So it's, that's not really where um, stuff happens. Um, so what I try to do with, you know, using the language of social position is to get away from a geographical, you know, Geneva versus New York, institutional human rights council is not quite important, but um, 
maybe strategic position could be better, how they, you know, whenever it's good for them, they could position themselves as part of, you know, Geneva. When it's not good, they're just getting out. So something, something um, that captures more um, the specific space that allows them to, to, to do specific things. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, an, an ambiguity. Yeah, I just need to sit more with it. It's 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 exactly what it is. Um, their ambiguous position and um, independence and delegation um, that's kind of disrupted. Um, let me see. Yeah, I think yeah, but these are really amazing questions, and especially about how to put together this material on the special rapporteurs. I kind of switched it around, and maybe I need to put it back into the other. So it used to be part of the of the other chapter, and then. I was like, well, maybe I'm talking about authority, but it, it, you're right, it, like the legal authority, the rational is very different from their logics of practice. And it, it really becomes obvious in the interviews that, you know, they're not really, you know, it's just there, but it's really about the legal practices that they can do. Um, I think, wow, there are lots of questions. Yeah, you have a few more <laughs> questions. <laughs> Alvina, and I think they're both like speaking to uh, your concept of authority too, by the sounds of it for the first are the sounds of it. So you have one from a joint one from Elspeth and Didier, who um, say the presentation indicates a profound tension between the vertical, so SP representing the UN as a superior regime, and horizontal SP as cajoling states into better practices by benchmarking. How do those work in terms of authority? So that's the first question. And then the second question, um, first of all, thank you um, uh, for your presentation. Um, but this question is again about authority in terms of the Arctic. So i.e. spokespersons of the Sami. Uh, they are represented in a certain degree by three different Sami parliaments in three different nations. While their legal status as a minority, um, let alone um, an indigenous people in Russia remains highly questionable, they have marginal status as a permanent participants in the Arctic Council. So their national and international positions of power is very limited. As it comes to light during the truth and reconciliation hearings, both in Norway and Finland, um, the, the um, uh, haven't read the Swedish report on that yet, the authority and the ability to represent of these parliaments is highly questionable within those groups. Are you taking this into account? And if so, how? Oh, tough questions. Yeah, to something I didn't present. Great. Um, I'll I'll take the first question first. Um, Didier and Elspeth. Um, I don't think you're my screen, but thank you so much. Um, yeah, maybe maybe I again the whole authority thing. Um, maybe throws me more off guard. Hi, Didier. Thanks for turning on the camera. Much nicer to speak to you like that. Um, in terms of the better practices and what they do with states, I think it's really about creating lasting social relations, which they are unable to do because they can't, you know, they need to choose where they're going. So they have one field trip and then they get out and then they have the report. And so what some of them have been able to do is use their time spent in a state, for example, on an academic visit to have an unofficial visit where they don't visit as a UN person, but they visit in their kind of personal capacity, but on the basis of a previous visit to tell states, um, you know, I'm here to help. I'm, I'm here not to just name and shame you. So this is what some have been trying to do to improve the, um, to, you know, get them into um, better human rights practices and adhere to these things. But I think um, because of the way in which the whole system is set up, not like maybe one or two have been able to do that everyone says they would like to be able to do that but I don't, I don't know if that answers the question um you you think so they're what they're trying maybe you want to come in Didier you're you're muted yes maybe it was too too cursive uh, one of the point is that what are their objectives and how they feel because they may have a position in which they want to reinforce the UN authority as UN as superior to national state, or they don't consider that. Okay. And they consider that what they can do is to create a benchmarking between the different states and to shame one state in comparison to the others. 
And it's two different strategies with two different forms of relation depending on, on their capital. So I, I would like you to, to be more precise about how, how they organize this kind of a double agents game in practice. Do they do simultaneously the two or not? It's less about the, their travel and so on. Okay, now, now I understand. Um, yeah, some of them have a strategy of kind of, you know, not just the worst practices, but also the best practices. And um, to, to, to kind of, yeah, to have this comparison, you know, oh, some states have been able to be so nice, you know, look at how they treated um, terrorism victims, for example, one of them said, or some of them collect like global best practices on the environment and then they share it with each state look look at what you guys are already doing for example so so it's much less about this is what the un framework says but it's more about what you are doing and then then um having this little competition between states not just this naming and shaming because they can't live up to the un um the un standards i guess but it's it's much less about the UN, I think, than, than really about human rights legislation, I think, for, for some of them, when they are intervening in national legislations, for example, or when they are intervening in national court cases, um, draft legislations that have a kind of human rights side to them, regional court cases, it's, it's not about you need to apply to the UN, but they see themselves as legal experts that can help you know, within a specific national um, framework, if that makes sense. Um, great, so we're um, running out of time, but I'm wondering if you wanted to respond to Anne's really detailed and complicated, like, well, her question raises some serious complications, right? So I wonder if you want to um, respond to that. Well, it's not really related to my current um, chapter, but I can say is I've interviewed someone who is um, part of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. It's, you know, people have different views about it, about their effectiveness and so on. And um, so my thesis, I'm not like, there's no space for me to do all four countries. I try to do that and it's just impossible because it's just so different. I'm really just focusing on Norway and the role of the UN in, in the making of, you know, Sami rights as indigenous people's human rights and how this kind of object informs Crimean Tatars um, kind of rights claims practices against the Russian annexation. So it's really, yeah, it's, it's a bit marginal from what I'm doing just because I'm really interested in international human rights rather than institutional um, parliaments. Um, just to jump in there, I was just wondering about when you're saying that you're talking about universalisms and universals, how you're taking into account that those spokespersons are not necessarily able to speak on the behalf of the entire group of people they are supposedly speaking for. Yeah, of course, um, I'm taking that into account. It's more about how they are able to get to a position to proclaim it. It's not, it's, it's not taking for granted, but it's, it's that they are able to go to Norway and, and be respected as human rights experts to kind of, you know, um, hear back what's going on on the ground and no one even questions their ability to write a report about the Sami people, like they like them a lot. So it's it's really about how how is this so taken for granted that that they can just do that, whereas others, you know, would get challenged on this. So this is this is what I'm trying to do. Um, Alvina, we're out of time, unfortunately, because I have so many questions, but I'll ask you another um, time. Email me, please. Yeah, I will. Yeah, mine are um, more particular to do with gender, but also around the shifting positionalities, but we'll pick that up at another time. Absolutely. Anyway, um, I want to um, sincerely thank you and Monique for um, coming to present your fascinating field work and Monique for giving such a thoughtful and engaged reading um, and, and, and critique of the work. Learned so much from both of you and for everyone's for their um, really great questions.